You are watching Dark Script, IT and InfoSec tutorials. Welcome back to Dark Script, and as always, thank you for joining and for leaving me great feedback for my previous videos. Just so you know, I take your comments very seriously and I always try to improve the content accordingly. So, this video is going to be quite entertaining, and I hope you learned something new by the end of it, because today we are exploring a very important OWASP top 10 vulnerability called injection attacks. And I want to show you what these injection attacks are and how you leverage them to obtain a full TCP reverse shell on your target. I won't be escalating privileges today, because otherwise it's going to take way longer than I expected. And the main purpose of this session is just to help you understand the different types and the different approaches to injection attacks, like command injection, uh, SQL injection, maybe even some code injection. Um, and of course, how you take advantage of such weaknesses uh, to exploit the service. Right, so if you look at the OWASP top 10 documentation online and search for A3, meaning uh, third position in the top 10 vulnerabilities, you'll see a section called injections and you can read through the description to understand what would fall under this injections category and you'll notice a long list of protocols and languages that can be affected by different types of injections like uh, XML or SOAP or uh, JSON, SQL, uh, command injections. But to keep it simple, an injection attack occurs when a user input is not validated properly, either on the client side or on the server side. And then the attacker abuses this lack of controls and injects malicious statements after a legitimate input. That's the idea, in a nutshell. Now, a classic example for an injection attack is called an SQL injection or SQL injection, and it looks like this. So we see a login page with a web form asking us to provide some input, and one is a, an email address and the other one is a password, which is pretty typical nowadays. Now, as a security practitioner, it's very important that you understand that it's never really guaranteed that a user would provide a valid input or that a user would actually enter uh, an actual email address or password. Nothing is preventing the user to just type a comma or a single quote or a command or anything really. Now, in most cases today, the server performs a validation of the user input. It verifies that what you entered in those fields meets certain criteria and doesn't contain any malicious statement. In fact, input validation can be and should be done on many different levels. And it always starts with the user, just you know, being careful with what they type in the field and ensuring that their input is valid. Then there is normally a client-side validation on the browser level or within the uh, HTML tags and the JavaScript code. And then after that, there would be normally some dedicated uh, web application firewall in place to make sure that no malicious patterns are detected in the request. And once the request passes through the firewall, the application logic itself should also be coded in a secure manner that prevents such injections from ever occurring. And there are also database level controls that can be set up for extra security. So input validation really needs to occur on more than a single layer. On the user side, it would be things like avoiding dangerous characters like quotes or double quotes or semicolons or double dashes. And then on the browser level, uh, we could use JavaScript to escape special characters like, uh, you know, these crocodile brackets or angle brackets, whatever you call them, um, quotes, uh, double quotes. And then on the web application firewall, you could set some packet inspection policy for uh, different suspicious patterns or keywords like uh, select, insert, uh, drop, or any SQL related statement, so to speak. On the application side, it's very important to ensure that the developers use parameterized queries or prepared statements to separate SQL logic from the user input and to ensure that the input is treated as data and not as executable code. And on the database level, it's usually important to implement good access control to restrict user permissions to the database uh, or disable features like uh, XPCMD shell, uh, which basically grants remote attackers direct access to the uh, operating system shell via SQL. But sometimes these validations are not in place, unfortunately, and attackers can take advantage of these uh, bad security practices to append malicious statements to their input. So back to this classic SQL injection example, we type a legitimate input, like an email address uh, or a username. 
but then pay attention to the single quote. A single quote in SQL normally terminates a statement. So assuming that this web page is looking up usernames and passwords in some SQL database, we are basically closing our legitimate statement with a single quote and then adding the malicious payload, which is or one equals one double dash. What does it do? The or operator tells SQL it's either this or that. Either you accept whatever input I provided in the first statement or one equals one or B equals B or four equals four. It doesn't really matter. Uh, one equals one simply means true because it's always true that one equals one. Uh, and then the double hyphen at the end of the statement is how you comment in SQL. So it tells SQL comment all the rest, meaning just ignore all the rest. Don't execute it. It's just a comment, not a real executable statement or command. So this basically gives SQL two options on the interpretation side. It's either it accepts only the email address or whatever input provided in the first statement, or the login validation is true or one equals one. Because in order to log you in, SQL is validating those two parameters, right? Username and password. And it looks them up in the database. And if they match, it returns true. There is a match. Otherwise, it returns false. So we're basically tricking SQL to return true. That's the whole idea. And this is what it would look like in the backend as SQL queries. Starting with the expected input. When you submit the form, it's interpreted in the backend like this. Select everything from a table called users, where the attribute called username equals Johnny, let's say, and the password attribute equals to the MD5 hash of the password that was entered by the user. Because obviously, for security reasons, we don't store credentials in the clear these days in databases. Now, let's have a look at the malicious payload. There is a single quote to close the statement or one equals one comment. So this is the malicious payload, right? Close the statement with a single quote or operator and a statement that's always true, like uh, one equals one or four equals four or whatever, and then comment all the rest. Pretty simple, right? So what is the result? Why do we call it an injection? The result looks like this. Select everything from the user's table where the username equals Johnny, just like before, or true, one equals one, and just ignore all the rest, don't execute it. Don't pay attention to the password, don't pay attention to the rest of the code. Just, you know, stop here. So I want to demonstrate it really quickly on an amazing vulnerable app called OWASP Juice Shop. Uh, you can also download it and set it up to practice web application hacking. It's super fun. I really recommend it. Uh, I'll add a link in the description for you. Anyway, um, so the app looks like this. It's like a virtual shop and there are lots of different functions here like purchasing stuff, uh, submitting feedback, sending emails, uh, commenting, and so on and so on. Uh, what we're looking for, we want to basically bypass the login mechanism, uh, which is vulnerable to SQL injection. So I'll click on login, and just to prove to you that it's actually validating usernames and passwords, I'll try admin first. So you see, invalid email or password. Okay, let's try uh, user1 at mail.com. Same thing. Now let's enter a malicious payload. Uh, I don't even need to enter any legitimate payload here. I just need to start from closing the empty statement and then add or one equals one and comment all the rest. And I'm in, there you go. Uh, and you can see I'm also logged as the administrator account. But now you should be asking yourselves, why the admin account? Why did it pick this one and not some other low privilege user, let's say? And the answer is quite simple. This SQL server is not really prepared for an attack like this. So it doesn't take it into account. It doesn't have any built in logic that tells it how to react or how to log you in if you perform such an attack. Uh, but I mean, that would be really absurd, right? <laughs> so it just defaults to the first user in the user's table. Uh, and alphabetically, it just makes perfect sense uh, that admin would be the first user, uh, or at least at the top of the list. But if we had another user called Adam, let's say, 
uh, it would log you in as Adam with Adam's permissions. So we're, we're just lucky that the word admin just happens to start with the letters AD. So command injection is absolutely fascinating because there is almost no limit to how creative you can get when you craft your payloads. And I want to list just a few other examples just to showcase different use cases for injection attacks that you, you may or may not encounter in web application testing. So the next ones are called OS command injections. And the idea here is very similar. Uh, you start with a legitimate statement, then you close it, and then you append your malicious command. One of the most popular ones is a simple command chaining. Let's assume that you have a simple application that does one thing. Yeah, it takes a DNS name as input and then returns to you its corresponding IP address. It's a simple name resolution. Then we have to imagine that in the backend, it looks like an NS lookup space domain.com or even uh, a simple ping command like ping space and uh, a domain name. So as a user, you enter your DNS name, the command is run on the Windows or the Linux backend OS, and it returns the results to the user. So command chaining allows you to inject multiple commands by chaining them with shell operators like end end or with a semicolon. So in this example, I could enter my DNS name, then add an operator, which means end in bash, and then another command like who am I or uh, cat Etsy password uh, or even more sophisticated scripts like uh, creating a new user account, downloading some malware, maybe using netcat to connect to a listener and uh, establishing a reverse shell. Uh, you'll be able to execute anything that the application user or the service account is allowed to do on that host. Another really cool example is called uh, file redirection or file overwrite through command injection. And with the right permissions, we could use the same methodology to echo content and pass it to a file to overwrite it. For example, overwriting a critical configuration file to elevate your privileges on, on some application or protocol. Uh, you could also use it to deface a website by overwriting the content of index.html. And another possibility is redirecting malicious binary data or code into a new file, making it executable and then executing it as a malware. You could also use piping to filter the data that's returned to you, like a simple ls-la um, to list all the files containing the word password recursively, and then redirecting the results to a file called results.txt. Uh, you could also abuse environment variables. For example, the command below sets the path environment variable to include some malicious path called slash tmp slash malicious at the beginning. Now, the path variable holds directories where executables are located in Linux. So by placing slash tmp slash malicious first, any executable in that directory will be found before those in the default system directories. So when the ls command is run, it looks for an executable called ls in slash tmp slash malicious first. And if you place a malicious script called ls in that directory, uh, it will run instead of the system's actual ls command. Uh, this is pretty cool if you want to trick another person uh, and make them look bad, but not the most useful um, use case. <laughs> Um, cool, so I've only shown you uh, some OS command injection examples and a simple SQL injection, but there is plenty more out there for uh, LDAP, XML, XPath, uh, JSON, PHP, any, any scripting or shell language or protocol has some injection vulnerabilities and most of them follow the same principles. Cool, so we have covered the theory and now let's see it in action. I like to use BWAP for command injection examples. It's another awesome vulnerable web application to practice ethical hacking, uh, hence the name BWAP for broken web application. I recommend that you download it from GitHub and set your own virtual machine where you have better control on the backend. Right, so we start with an ifconfig to check my local IP address, that's 192.168.175. I'll run a quick nmap discovery scan to find the IP address of my vulnerable machine, should be the 198. Let's open a web browser and access the app.
log in with my credentials and look for my command injection challenge. Okay, so this one is exactly the same challenge I was describing before. It's a simple name resolution mechanism that takes user input and executes uh, NSLOOKUP in the backend and returns information about the domain. So if you look up www.nsa.gov, you'll see a typical NSLOOKUP output. If you enter google.com, you'll see pretty much the same behavior. Now let's try to append to this command. I'll use the end end operator to terminate the first command and execute a new one, like uh, who am I? And you can see that I now see the name of the user running the app, which is www-data. I can also try to read sensitive files like uh, Etsy passwords. So it's quite obvious that this application is vulnerable to command injection. Let's see if I can skip the valid input and just run the operator plus the command. Apparently I can, good. Right, uh, let's set a local proxy for my web browser and open Burp Suite to intercept traffic and see if we can capture those requests and abuse them in a different way. I'll launch a test command and hope it's getting captured, let's see. And it's, it's perfect. One thing I can do here is send it to Intruder and brute force my target with different uh, OS commands. I can get a simple word list for this, just to show you how I can save myself time running many commands uh, in a short time. So I'll select a simple payload and obtain a word list from payload box on GitHub. The one for Unix should do. Then paste it in burp and start the brute force attack. And then I can uh, even render the responses in HTML and gradually go through the results to see if there is anything interesting in there. But this is not a really uh, efficient way to work. Uh, I'll stop the attack now and I'll show you uh, something much cooler, a much more efficient tool called Comics. So Comics will take advantage of this command injection vulnerability and use the post request to simulate a shell. It's not a real shell, but it's just much more convenient to keep testing this way. So I'll copy the post request. And I'll paste it in a file called hack.txt. Turn off my proxy for now and start comics-r, which stands for request, against the hack.txt file containing the request. Oops, sorry, I had to uh, specify the full path. Sometimes it times out and you need to try again. There you go. There you go. Then it will ask me a bunch of questions about resuming previous sessions, because I've already used this tool before. And it's identifying the vulnerabilities and asking me if I want to start a pseudo terminal shell. I say yes. And you can see I have a shell-like interface that allows me to send commands more easily. So we're basically abusing this vulnerable field that allows us to run commands directly on the server. Uh, it's not exactly what we would call a bind TCP shell. Uh, for the sake of persistence and sometimes even uh, for the sake of stealth, because we don't want to be detected by firewalls and antiviruses, I might want to switch to a reverse TCP shell from here. And Comics supports this very well. It supports this feature with its own built-in payloads. So I'll type reverse underscore TCP and then set my listener address and port number. Select number two for other TCP shells. And I want an interpreter reverse TCP shell, so I'll select number 12 to use a web delivery script. 
I'm pretty sure number 9 would have also worked fine because BWAP is a PHP based application, but it's not really that important. It will still work. I'm happy as long as it works. Yeah, uh, number 2 for PHP. There you go. And you can see it's creating a metasploit command that we need to type in a separate tab. Uh, as sudo, of course. And the exploit is just creating a listener on your machine and then forcing the target to establish a reverse TCP meterpreter shell with you. If I go back to the left terminal, I can see already an interpreter session has been created. Uh, now I have full convenience. I can switch to my interpreter session now and start escalating my privileges or uh, monitoring uh, running processes or other cool stuff that interpreter allows you to do remotely. And that was command injection. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. Now you can show off to your friends and tell them you know what command injections are, and they don't because they're noobs. If you like my content, or if it somehow helps you fall asleep better at night, I invite you to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment, share on social media, and just be awesome. You're all awesome. <laughs> uh, thank you for watching and for supporting the expansion of this project. If you haven't done so yet, I also encourage you to watch the previous episodes about access control lists, the WannaCry malware, our poisoning, and more. Stay connected, stay safe, hit those buttons below, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.